Okay, guys, so uh, we're going to continue with the um, Confessions of St. Augustine. Uh, last week, we kind of gave an overview of what exactly this text is about and, and why it's important and so forth. Uh, so today, I want to kind of delve more into the actual um, chapters and kind of get an idea of how this fits into the course material, right? How this fits into the question of uh, our existential situation and, and the human condition and, and so forth. Right? And in doing so, you, you'll be able to see some of the uh, parallels, very clear parallels between Augustine, Gilgamesh, and uh, Odysseus, and, and some of the other thinkers that we've seen. And we can also begin to see why this is such a popular text and why it continues to be relevant uh, today. So, first of all, let's kind of situate ourselves in Augustine's time period, okay? Uh, he's, he's giving us a, a background um, into his personal experience, right? He does not begin with kind of like, uh, what would be standard for a philosophical text. He kind of begins with what he experienced, okay? And we'll see why this is important. So what exactly was the world like uh, at the time of St. Augustine, right? So we can try to appreciate that and put ourselves in his shoes. First was that the late Roman Empire at that time was in decline meaning that you had the, it's very similar to any kind of political crisis, right? When there is a political crisis, certain issues become more, um, uh, more profound, right? More directly experienced. And one of the things that was, was experienced and what was beginning to surface was, uh, the question of decadence, right? The question of, uh, um, corruption. The question of luxury, right? The, the the decadence of the Roman elite in terms of wealth, in terms of uh, culture, in terms of art, and so forth. So these were things that were beginning to, to surface. And in reaction, you had the, the debates between different philosophical or religious groups was intensifying. So at the time, you had several different groups. And keep in mind, uh, you really didn't have this uh, uh, clear distinction between religious groups and philosophical groups and political groups, right? These were all different belief systems that uh, could be adopted and that were, were actually competing with one another, right? So you had the Stoicist. Now, the Stoicist were... Stoicism is, is a... Uh, it's kind of like a refinement of uh, cynicism and the idea behind stoicism and part of its appeal at a time of decadence was that it uh, taught the idea of self-discipline fortitude and self-control meaning the voluntarily abstaining from certain world pleasures right how did you do so the model for them was the laws of nature, right? That one ought to uh, uh, conform to the laws of nature and to develop a sort of clear judgment, an inner calm, and a freedom from suffering. And so, in other words, they saw in nature, in the laws of nature, a sort of harmony, a sort of equilibrium, and that evil or uh, discontentment right, was a product of a disequilibrium. It was a product of us not living in accordance with the harmony that is already imprinted in the cosmos. And so the task of man was to reflect on uh, the laws of nature in such a way that is objective and a way that is unemotional. Right, and then to live according to those reflections that can be again inferred from the nature, from the laws of nature, and 
the, this idea of, of, of living according to nature really centered allow, around this idea of logos, which will become more important for us as we go on. Um, essentially, logos means that there is a natural and a universal reason in things, right? That one can discover. And that living according to it uh, was essentially the source of goodness, living according to nature, according to the laws of reason, and living according to one's essential nature was what would bring about uh, uh, contentment. So, so the, uh, whether it's on the individual level or on the social level. So this was somewhat of uh, an abstract set of doctrines. I mean, it wasn't so much a political set of doctrines. And that's why it was more marginal than it was um, political at that time. In contrast to other uh, world forms that we all see. And it's also, it's also evident why this kind of idea would be uh, attractive, right? given that it draws on a strong Greek heritage and that it, it, it deals with some of these existential questions, which is where to, where from, and what are the grounds onto which we can live an authentic life, right? What do we appeal to? What we appeal to nature. Uh, so this idea of a transcendental God or the Platonic ideal forms was not prominent in Stoic literature. It was not the main, um, if you can say, it was not the ultimate concern precisely because nature revealed itself to man. Therefore, man was not really in need of, of revelation or of a philosopher king or of anything of that sort. Now, you also had Christianity. And Christianity at this time was also in a period of transformation, but we will get to this. But essentially, the the idea behind Christianity, the, 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 the germane and the rudimentary basics of Christianity at that time was that God is the creator of the world. So our ultimate concern ought to be God, not necessarily, not exclusively or ultimately the laws of nature and that God created the world from nothingness. So God was not co-eternal with nature or with the platonic forms, right? God was essentially absolute and transcendent. And that uh, uh, the ultimate redeemer, the, old, the only medium to God was Christ, right? And Christ would provide uh, salvation, meaning that you cannot find redemption through conforming to the laws of nature or through the philosopher king, but that redemption was to be sought out in the works of uh, in in uh, submission essentially and recognition of Christ as being the savior as being the son of god or god incarnate of course there were different uh, christian sects at that time but this was the dominant opinion the idea of the trinity and so forth now there was a there were other of course philosophies but the, the one that we want to focus on is a philosophy called Manichaeism. And this was founded in the third century AD by a prophet named Mani. Um, he was also known as the Apostle of Light, the Supreme Illuminator. And it was founded in Persia. So it was not a European philosophy. Um, and it was uh, dualistic. It was a dualistic philosophy that essentially the, 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 the idea of Manichism was that life in this world or this world in general is essentially uh, is essentially to an extent um, let's say evil, okay? Uh, this is Gnosticism. So they did not have an optimistic vision of this world. Uh, for the Christians, the, this world was essentially a place for redemption, right? For the Stoics, uh, 
uh, this world was considered a world that is governed by a harmony, by a, a cosmic equilibrium. For the Manicheans, they did not have this optimistic outlook on the world, right? And this is one of the reasons why it was actually attractive, right? It appealed to certain commonsensical um, dispositions which you might have, certain intuitions. Uh, so in the same way, for example, Stoicism appeals to this idea of laws of nature and that there is order and that there is harmony and that the truth is accessible, right? This is somewhat of an intuitive idea. Manichaeism uh, appealed to this intuitive idea that this world essentially is defined by radical evil, right? Uh, by, by false pleasures, by suffering, and so forth. And it's easy to see why this idea would be appealing for uh, people who were living at a time in which uh, Christianity and in which it's the, the Roman Empire was essentially in a state of decadence, right? State of corruption, bloodshed, interfighting, uh, wars, right? Decline, and so forth. Now, for the Manichaeans, the only way to escape this state of evil was essentially through uh, inner illumination inner illumination and inner illumination meant that the soul has this kind of the, the quality of the soul is as such that uh, it has certain negative elements and it, the only way to purge those negative elements is through giving it positive elements and the approach was a materialistic approach so they literally believed that you had dark matter for example dark matter right of course not in the same sense that we use it today scientifically you had kind of like dark matter and uh positive matter light right uh so man right mm -hmm. being composed of this dark matter of this negative uh, uh of this of this darkness Right? The only way to purge himself and to cleanse himself from um, this, uh, from the, 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 this, this negative energy, from, from this dark matter, was through light. So darkness, it's purged through light. It is purged through the spirit or through intelligence. To know oneself is to recover one's true self, which had previously been clouded by ignorance and the lack of self-conscious. Why? Because, again, there is this mingling between matter, right, which was essentially evil, and, uh, and the body. So, quite simply, uh, the only way to escape um, the evil of materiality and, and bodily desires is to transcend it. Right and transcendence is essentially embodied or symbolized by light. Now, the, to, to kind of appreciate or understand the, this philosophy a bit more, um, we should think about what exactly was it trying to address, right? And what it was trying to address was the philosophical problem of evil, right? And this is a question that perplexed philosophers since the beginning of time and that is what is evil and why does evil exist in the world right so what is evil meaning that when i have this disposition or this intuitive sense that this world has certain evil individuals right or it contains certain evil incidents or whatever it is right I must confront the question, well, what is evil? So is evil something that I can point to physically, right? Is evil something that is essentially inherent into the nature of the universe, into the nature of, of, of life in the world, right? That we are in this fallen state. So by default, the, the world is evil and the exception is goodness and light. Um, and if evil is not something that is tangible, then what is it, right? What exactly is evil? Now, 
think of it this way. If my laptop, right, let's say I'm typing up my dissertation and suddenly my laptop turns off. Is this evil? Well, somebody could argue that the laptop has no will, free will of its own. It has no intentionality. It has no sense of good and bad. It is merely following certain mechanical, let's say, mechanical processes. So it is neither good or evil. It is simply the way things are. The same thing can be said, for example, about cancer, right? Cancer is a uh, mutation, right? There is no sort of um, uh, uh, evil intention that is conjured by the cell or by the body, and it wants to uh, essentially sabotage your future, and then it says, you know what, I'm going to mutate. It's simply following a certain set of random biological processes or deviating from certain biological processes and so forth. And so if the world uh, is merely governed by laws, right, and these laws are merely processes, they're material processes, uh, they lack intentionality, then these laws simply describe the way things are, right? And if they simply describe what is and the way things are, then how can we account for good and evil, right? How can we come to say that this event is good and that this event is evil? And then even if we say that, for example, uh, let's say if you were to uh, murder is evil, well, then someone can simply point out that when you are calling out the act of murder, what you are really calling out is an act of killing, right? It is just a physical phenomenon that you are describing. But is there anything inherently evil into it, right? What are the grounds for evil and how do we account for it? And this is a perplexing problem because the idea of evil is, to, to a large extent, a necessity when we want to think about our politics, our morality, and so forth. And it is also necessarily because there is this intuition, right? There is this concrete experience wherein we feel that certain things are good and certain things are bad. Certain things are cruel and certain things are pleasing. And later we'll see why, for example, this plays out in the idea of death. right? And we saw how this was a gut-wrenching problem for, for Oedipus, right? The, the, uh, the impersonal cosmos that does not care about your happiness or your uh, or your fate or your demise, right? It simply flows according to impersonal um, processes, right? A certain absolute linear flow of time uh, that doesn't really take into consideration your well-being. Um, and, and this also begs the question for the Manichians and, and others, was the world created for man or was it created in spite of man, right? Without regards or 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 um or or concern for the well-being of man or man's project which as we said is to ask fundamental questions such as where where from and to enact a historical project to try to live an authentic life and so forth and where does it leave us if we cannot address the problem of evil Right? Where does this leave us? If we cannot say that such and such act is good and such and such act is evil, well then what does this mean for our existential project, which is to live a good life, regardless of what that is? So clearly, the, 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 the problem of evil is a very prominent problem. And we will see that this problem is exactly what will lead... Uh, 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 Augustine, right, to begin looking towards, uh, to begin looking towards alternatives. This is a problem that will really vex him. That will that will will will, will kind of rip him apart, right, and lead to this sort of existential crisis, which is very similar to the existential crisis of Gilgamesh, and as we will see with Abu Hamid al Ghazali and whatnot. So that is the background, that we have these three competing schools, Stoicism, Manichaeism, and uh, Christianity.
we have the young Saint Augustine, and we have Saint Augustine's personal uh, upbringing and his own experience. So this is where I want to begin, right? Why is significant about the way that this text is written? So now we just talked about previously. We talked about certain philosophical problems and philosophical schools, the problem of evil and so forth. Now, you would expect that a text which addresses these things would begin with a philosophical opening, right? For example, I am going to argue that X, Y, Z leads to A, B, C, and so forth, right? Or I will hereby um, make the following argument, and so forth. But Augustine does not begin in this way. Right, He begins in a very, what might appear to us to be an unconventional way. He begins by detailing his own personal experience. Now, this is odd to us as students of modern philosophy, because usually our personal experiences are considered to be subjective, they are private, and they are irrelevant to public philosophical debate and discourse. But for St. Augustine and, and for the state of philosophy at that time, that was not necessarily the case, right? In many instances, and what makes Augustine so brilliant is that he begins with the concrete. He begins with life, with his own personal experiences. And so he goes from the concrete towards what we can describe as being the abstract, right? Towards the philosophical. And this is what is appealing about St. Augustine, that he begins with himself. He begins with the most intimate details and facts about his own upbringing, right? The details of some of his childhood incidents, of his own deeds, of his own sins, of his own inner deviations, and so forth. And from these concrete experiences, he begins to articulate a philosophy. A philosophy of life. Now, why is this important? And why does this make Augustine so brilliant? Because a philosophy of life essentially needs to address the concrete experiences of men and not merely the philosophical questions that we might ask in an abstract way in a CVSP course or in a uh, conference or on a paper or in a book. Augustine is not concerned with this in this text. Augustine is concerned with a philosophy of life, a philosophy that addresses not just his cognitive, his intellectual curiosities, but the totality of his being, right? Something that addresses uh, dispositions and feelings as intimate and private as his sexuality, right? As his deviations, as his desires, as the question of love, right? The question of love we will see is central to the philosophy of St. Augustine, right? It is not something that is the uh, sole um, purview of art and culture and fiction. It is something that is central to philosophy. And as we will see, that as it turns out, that Augustine and later Ghazali and, and others will actually demonstrate that our experiences are just as important as our cognitive uh, activities. Meaning that when I sit, for example, right, and I try to employ a logical argument in my head, I can reach certain conclusions, right? I can reach certain modes of knowledge. Augustine will demonstrate that through experiencing the world, for example, experiencing love, experiencing God, experiencing the Holy Spirit, for, for Augustine, of course, that this is also a mode of knowing, that this is also a way of uh, illumination that is, in fact, superior to knowledge that purely comes through cognition. So there is a reason why this is written as an autobiographical, te autobiographical text because it wants to demonstrate the centrality of experience in what we call epistemology, which is what do we know and how do we know it? So for example, 
let's say, and I think I gave this example before, let's say I were to tell you, uh, you know, I was coming to class and I'd be like, guys, you know, I visited this beautiful city um, in Granada, Spain, right? It was absolutely beautiful. And I took all these pictures and, and I'm showing you guys the pictures and you guys are like, okay, and you're just nodding your head. And I can tell that there's something lacking. And then, so I might respond by saying something like, well, you had to be there. You had to experience it. And, you know, anytime, for example, you go on a vacation and, um, you know, you try to relate to your friends what you saw, even if, you know, you took photographs, HD photographs, you documented the whole thing and so forth, right? You know, intuitively, that experiencing the city, for example, is different than experiencing, uh, different than looking at photographs or just having data or information about the city when it was founded and so forth. And the same thing applies to, um, later Ghazali would use this example, um, knowing about love, right? Reading about it, romance novels, psychology books, psychoanalysis, uh, through existentialist literature and so forth. It is one thing to read about love, and then it is a fundamentally different thing to experience it. So Augustine, so this will be the method of Saint, this will be one of the, the primary method of Saint Augustine, and then he will also build onto that, of course, a rational method. So ultimately, to end, we'll end here, uh, to kind of give you a mental map of where we're going. What is, what exactly is St. Augustine going to try to do? St. Augustine is going to grapple with two questions, the question of God and the question of evil. And he wants to ask, how do we reach these truths? So, assuming that they exist, right, how do we even reach them? What are the tools, right? Remember the example we gave? When it comes to physical objects, do we use a telescope or do we use a microscope, right? Well, when it comes to non-material, non-physical objects, how do we even begin to understand it? Let alone have a relationship with it. How can we have a relationship with something that is outside of time and space, right? So Augustine, through this text, will try to demonstrate a, a method through which we can go from a state of... Uh, the fallen state, the state of ignorance, right? And being perplexed, this existential anxiety and dread, essentially to a state of knowing God and understanding the problem of evil. And not only knowing God, but being able to be in communion, being able to engage in a relationship with God. And this is, well, this uh, uh, will set him you know, on a journey wherein he is able to synthesize the experience as a mode of knowing and Neoplatonic philosophy, right? Which is again a more rationally methodic um, method method of knowing, and that is the brilliance of, of of Saint Augustine, and that is precisely why he is and remains uh, so appealing. So we will begin with that. We will begin with the problem, the issue of God in St. Augustine's work. Uh, and the issue, and then after that, we will engage with the issue of, and the problem of evil, inshallah. See you guys on Thursday.